So, maybe you're a young Mormon and catching trash from other people your age that say Mormons are weird. And they tell you things you haven't heard in primary or Sunday school or seminary. You hear about weird things on the internet and you wonder, what is the deal with this church? What's the truth about it? Well, I'm going to give some history here that kind of helps out and gives a little perspective from a view of someone coming into the church as a convert possibly and what they might encounter. I'm sure you've probably heard things like Mormons have got lots of wives. They're all polygamists. Or Mormons worship a different Jesus. Or maybe they're Amish. They wear funny clothes. They think Jesus was a devil's brother. Or don't you know that you can become a god and have children that worship you in eternity that your family can expand and expand and expand forever that God lives on a planet named Kolob and that you can become a god and Christians just hate this idea of Mormons becoming gods they say it's blasphemy they're kind of like Islamic terrorists they terrorize Mormons over having different beliefs well I can bring some perspective to this so, let's say you're a person that's just been introduced to the church by a friend and you come to sacrament meeting on fast and testimony day and what do you see? You see a bunch of tiny children lining up at the beginning and saying, I want to bear my testimony and I know the church is true and I know that Joseph Smith was a prophet and the Book of Mormon is true, that he translated it by the gift and power of God and that Thomas S. Monson, meaning Thomas Spencer Monson, if they're really up on things, is a true prophet of God, that Heavenly Father inspires our bishop, and I love my mommy and daddy, and I'm thankful for family home evening sometimes, and especially when mom makes treats and makes it worthwhile, and we have a really short lesson, play some fun games. And I love my primary teacher, and in the name of, um, yeah, anyway, you know how that goes. So... If you've been used to that all your life, maybe it's not a shock to you, but when your friend comes to church with you, they're like, what's up with these guys? How do those little children know that Joseph Smith was a true prophet? Well, that's a valid question. Have you ever asked yourself? Have you ever asked yourself? Have you ever had a friend ask you, so you believe that God came to New York to talk to Joseph Smith the first time the guy ever prayed? Are you serious? Well... Anyway, we're going to get into some of these things and kind of tell it like it is because I understand what it's like to be introduced to the church. And another thing people say is, why did you add on to the Bible? The Bible says you can't add on to this book or else you'll get cursed with the curses of this book. Because it does say something like that in Deuteronomy and in Revelations. Of course, the fact that it says in Deuteronomy is a problem for Christians for the rest of the Bible if they want to quote that. But... As a Mormon, you've got a lot of extra scripture. You've got the Book of Mormon. And the Book of Mormon told Joseph Smith that the Bible was all screwed up because the Catholic Church perverted it, took out plain and precious parts of the scriptures, and corrupted it. First Nephi chapter 13 says basically that. And so you get some of the Pearl of Great Price, the Book of Moses, out of the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, which the reorganized church has. And then you get the Egyptian mummy dealer, coming by and Joseph Smith buying the mummies with some money he got from somebody else and uh, translating an additional book of scripture he said it was written by the hand of Abraham of course you might have heard that there's problems with that assertion these days and you've got the Joseph Smith history and you've got the you know other things there and you got the doctrine and covenants all these revelations God's supposed to be a God of revelation, says Joseph Smith, although you got about 132 revelations out of Joseph Smith in the Doctrine and Covenants, and then for about the next, you know, 15 presidents of the church, you got about five more. So, you know, six, seven, whatever. Um, you don't need a calculator, really, to figure out that something's changed. Anyway, let's get started. I'm going to basically do a series on an introduction to the foundation of Mormonism. 
So you'll learn some, some history you haven't heard in church, and you'll hear what it's like to be introduced to the church. I thought maybe I'd try to do uh, a rendition of, hey, this is uh, Mormon history. So, um, or how someone gets introduced to the church. So, you get introduced to the missionaries, and they've got some lessons for you. Now, I don't know exactly how that goes these days, but back in the day, they would start off telling you about the Joseph Smith story, which is something that you find in the Pearl of Great Price there under Joseph Smith history. Not that he wrote it. Some other guy wrote it in in you know, in the first person, as if he w pretended first person, as if he was Joseph Smith. At least the first vision portion of that, which was published in 1842. So basically, here's the deal: they say, well, this young 14-year-old boy was uh, exposed to these uh, revival meetings that were going on in the neighborhood, and. Uh, Everybody was excited about joining some sort of a church, and he became concerned for the welfare of his soul. So he listened to basically the Methodists, the Presbyterians, and the Baptists, and was a little partial to the Methodists, but says he read their scriptures and, you know, listened to what they had to say, and said so they all tra they, they'd all tra they'd all interpret the same thing and mean something different. So he says he's reading in the book of James, and it says... If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given. But let him ask in faith. Because if you don't ask in faith, then you're like a wave of the sea, and you're unstable in all your ways, it goes on to say. So, um, I guess it says he reads and prays, you know, reads. It doesn't say he prays. He thinks about it. And by the way, it makes it sound like his family has, you know, had some sort of religious experience. Maybe. I don't know. But then he says he goes off in the woods to pray, and he says it's the first time he's ever prayed out loud in his life. So he's 14 years old. It doesn't sound like a religious home. You'd think they'd had him say, you know, grace at dinner or bedtime prayers or something, you know. But it says he's the first time he'd ever attempted to pray vocally. So the first time he's ever prayed vocally, and God the Father comes along with his son Jesus all the way to New York just to introduce themselves for God to introduce Jesus. And then he doesn't say anything else. All he says is, Hey, Joseph, this is my beloved son. Hear him. That's what, that's what he says. That's it. That's what the master of the universe had to say. Okay, so then Joseph Smith says he has a talk with Jesus. He gets a hold of himself after being a little bit, you know, shocked that God came all the way to New York on his first prayer. And uh, he asks him what church he's supposed to join. And, and then he's, he's told that they're all basically abominations. And oddly enough, the Lord seems to be quoting scriptures, mostly out of the Old Testament, maybe all out of the Old Testament, if I recall correctly. Yeah, directly quoting scripture from the Old Testament, but say things like, you know, their hearts are far from me, and, you know, they teach for commandments, the doctrines, the commandments of man, having a form of godliness, but lacking the power thereof, etc. Various other Old Testament quotes that Jesus uses. He doesn't say much of anything that's original, it's just he quotes the Old Testament. And, uh, okay, so they come all the way to New York and tell them not to join any other churches. They're all abominations or preachers or, you know, what are the words they use, you know? Anyway, they're, they're corrupt. So it doesn't sound like a good thing. So the next thing he says is that, is that he's in the company of a Methodist minister and he tells him uh, about this vision and the guy says it's all the devil and everyone's persecuting him. Well, didn't Jesus just tell him not to go after? He said, I was told not to go after them. And then there he is with the Methodist preacher. So he says, everybody united to persecute him. And then uh, it just goes, and it skips ahead three years, and he's praying, supposedly in his room. And uh, he's concerned about his sinful life. And uh, nothing too bad, he says, but, you know, he hung out with jovial company. And an angel shows up. The version we have now says his name is Moroni. He used to say Nephi, but Orson Pratt, one of the early apostles, apparently changed that from what I've read. So Moroni shows up and uh, tells him his sins are forgiven. And uh, on top of that, he, uh, he has a mission for him. He's got the golden plates with the record of the Nephites in it, you know, as we know what the Book of Mormon is, that the people that came over from Jerusalem 600 B.C., not to mention the fact that there's another group that came over at the time of the Tower of Babel, or Babel, as people think it is, 2200 B.C., and that actually the American Indians descended from Moroni's, from his brethren, from, you know, his people, 
or the people of his, uh, you know, anyway, people he's related to. So that's where the American Indians came, came from, and they're Jews, or they're Israelites. Uh, three tribes came across, uh, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Judah, people from all those three tribes. And uh, they came across, and they've got, they've got their own scriptures and a, and, and a record of Jesus coming to visit in the Americas. And it's very important because it's got, it's got materials in it that are going to uh, add to or restore truths that were in the Hebrew scriptures that the Catholic Church took out. So he may not have elaborated on all that, but we don't know what he supposedly elaborated on. But he, he comes back three, time, he, three times more. He comes back two more times that night, so it's three times that night, and then the next day, same thing. And then he adds a few things every time. And all the words that we hear he speaks just happen to be quotes out of the Old Testament, oddly enough. So the sins are forgiven. Anyway, so the next day he goes to find the golden plates in the hill. And he gets there, but he can't take them. And it says because he hasn't kept the commandments of the Lord. So he was just forgiven for all his sins during the night by this angel. And by the time he gets to the, to the hill, I guess he's so sinful again that now he can't get the plates. Well, that's what it says. Um, yeah, go figure, huh? It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. So he has to go back every year. And, and, and the, the primary source, or original documents that we read, are a little different from what got into the uh, Pearl of Great Price and what happened on those various visits. But uh, he gets them after, you know, four years, and uh, gives the dimensions of them. So they should have weighed about 200 pounds, you know, since if they were gold and they were ha with those dimensions. But he doesn't seem to have any problem with that. In fact, when he goes up to get them in the middle of the night, when the equinox at midnight, dressed in black with a black horse and a black carriage and all this sort of thing. Um, and of course, it doesn't mention that in the Pearl of Great Price either, but that's that's uh, original source stuff. So he goes and gets them, and, and we do see things in the church movies like him running with these plates and some guys are trying to get them in the woods and all that sort of thing, you know, to take them because they the devil's helping them, you know, or something. They know he's getting these golden plates and they want it to get the gold, but he bashes them with the gold plates and keeps running. Which is pretty amazing, since they would have weighed about 200 pounds in those dimensions. But, like we said, nothing mentioned about that. And he gets back, and, 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 and with the place, there were these um, special spectacles, it says, in the third chapter of the book of Ether there, that were prepared by the Lord in order to translate ancient languages, such as Reformed Egyptian, which they are supposedly in. Yeah, so, he's got basically what someone might call magic glasses. I don't want to sound too irreverent there, but uh, so the spectacles, you know, uh, two clear stones set in a silver bow, the use and interpret the use the, uh, of them constituted what were called seers in ancient times, it says. So, he translates the book, it says, yeah, the, it, and, and it says, uh, among other things, that the Catholic Church has wrecked the Bible by, well, they put the Bible together, let's face it, and they just took, you know, various Hebrew scrolls and uh, decided what they wanted in it. Maybe some Roman scrolls there in the New Testament. So, it says that many plain and precious parts were taken out. So that gives him the uh, the, the go-ahead, I uh, hate to say the excuse, to start retranslating the Bible and changing anything that doesn't look quite right to him, or that God reveals to him is problematic. So he he uh, goes basically right. He starts at Genesis, and he's he's, he's there in the you know in the New Testament all all the way through. Now he has I don't, <clears throat> it kind of sounds like he really you know got into detail the first part there. He's got about an extra three chapters of, you know out of the first few in Genesis there. He's got these big stories convoluted in some cases between you know Cain and his satanic Illuminati Freemason Freemasonic uh, secret society there basically, and uh, then he's got the uh, story of Enoch and his people building the city of Zion and all these great visions that he has and living with Jesus and getting translated and so forth. So he's got about three chapters worth, is, is what I'm just going to estimate, of new stuff there, you know, along with the, you know, the creation business and whatever the Bible has in it for about the first few chapters there. So, 
you've got, you know, verses here and there, but the first eight they've got in the Pearl of Great Price is the Book of Moses. So there's the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, now called the Community of Christ, basically had pretty much the rights to what they call the inspired version of the Bible. So that was, Joseph Smith went through it and things are changed. All through it there are changes made, which he says, you know, God inspired him to do. So, now he had to use, supposedly he's supposed to use the magic spectacles, or the the, the, the interpreters, but supposedly Moroni took those away or something, and, and so he winds up using a seer stone, which he was already familiar with. It's kind of like a crystal ball, works the same way basically, I suppose, except for it's not clear. He had a brown rock, but what he does is he sticks it in his hat and puts his face in his hat and blocks out the light, and then somehow a light glows out of it, and he could see pieces of parchment uh, which had the interpretation uh, in English on it for the Book of Mormon, and you see pictures, you know, by church artists, I guess, that show him, you know, with these weird glasses looking at the plates or just looking at these plates. But actually, what what his scribes said, including his wife, you know, and then a couple of guys that were like some of the three witnesses, I think, Martin Harris and David Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery, they said he stuck his face in the hat, and sometimes, or maybe, maybe never the, you know, sometimes the plates weren't there even. Um, they weren't even there, so I mean, they were like buried in the woods or something in a log or call a log. Yeah, so he's got his face in a hat. So why does he need the plates? Some people ask uh, if he can just look in his hat list, like looking in a crystal ball. So he, these were kind of popular back then, and uh, you know maybe people use crystal balls now. They use dark mirrors to do all kinds of magic. But he was a magician, and he used a, a seer stone for you know he was kind of famous. People came to him. He was so he met his wife. He was hired to be the seer. You know he looked into his hat at the rock to try to they're trying to find you know like a silver mine or various things or buried treasure. And he was out on one of these expeditions. That's how he, he met his wife. He was staying at the home of uh, one of the guys that was on the expedition. His name was Isaac Hale. Anyway, farmer's daughter story. And uh, he elopes with the daughter there. And uh, that was Emma, his wife. So there are many other first-hand accounts of him being involved in this sort of thing, you know, back home before he was on this expedition. His dad was on this expedition, too. And they were looking for buried treasure, pirate treasure, stuff like that. I think he read about Captain Kidd and all that sort of thing. Who, incidentally, like... <laughs> The names like Moroni and Kumura, Kamura, very similar, were associated with the, some island where Captain Kidd was like supposedly hiding treasure or hanging out on. Anyway, kind of interesting. So, uh, apparently they had they had uh, diggings at at night for treasure, at, and he was the guy guiding them at least some of the time and peeking into the hat at his uh, his seer stone. And and when they start digging, they'd have to do these magic rituals because there were you know demons that guarded the treasures and stuff. And uh, sometimes that you know they draw a magic circle with a magic knife and you know do kinds of enchanted things, sacrifice like a black dog or a black sheep or goat or whatever <clears throat> by like cutting its throat and then making it walk around the circle until it died, something. Then they'd probably have like barbecued goat or dog, <laughs> barbecued dog. I wonder if they'd sweet and sour with it. So. <clears throat> That seems kind of a weird background for a guy that's supposed to be a holy prophet, but <clears throat> maybe that's why they don't teach that in Sunday school. But if you look at the, you know, if you, if you look at the documentation from, you know, including family members that talked about these expeditions, uh, that seems to be what was going on. Of course, like I said, the, you know, the missionaries aren't going to say that. In fact, most of them never heard of it. And they never heard of the seer stone either. They thought he used the magic glasses instead of the magic uh, brown rock. You know. Anyway. And so some scholars kind of Actually, I've read older history. I mean, even like Joseph Fielding Smith, we know he's one of the presidents of the church. He's like, you know, grandson, great-grandson of Joseph Smith's brother, right? Um, you know, he he wrote about it or summarized, you know, from the words of, say, David Whitmer discussing that. You know, he the, said that the, the, the words wouldn't disappear and, and give new words until the scribe, you know, Oliver Cowdery or whoever, David Whitmer, Martin Harris or Emma, to, until they would uh, correctly write down every word. So it should have been perfect. Of course, Jesus said it was perfect in the uh, first section of the Doctrine and Covenants, which used to be the preface to the Book of Commandments, where they trashed that and kind of rewrote some of the revelations. Said so Jesus actually said something different, in, in some of them, and called it the Doctrine and Covenants. So um, it said, "Yeah, I gave him the power, and he did it right, and it's all good." You know, and pay attention to everything he says. It's just like me talking. It's DNC one paraphrasing a little bit, but if you read it, it gives massive authority to Joseph Smith, the proofs of the Book of Mormon. And then since that time, there's been like, you know, close to 4,000 corrections in it, changes and corrections. A lot of them are grammatical, but 
there's a lot of the book of Isaiah in there, which, of course, in the story, we have uh, him bringing over some brass plates with Old Testament in it, and, and supposedly he's got Isaiah in there. In fact, he's even got stuff from Isaiah that would have been written by whoever wrote Isaiah um, about eight years after they left Jerusalem, which is uh, kind of weird. So um, that stuff's copied in, like, word for word out of the King James Bible, and it doesn't seem to have mistakes, but somehow the seer stone worked perfectly for that stuff, matching what was in their family Bible. But he, there's like an average, you know, if you, if you figure like 4,000, you know, changes in the Book of Mormon, that's like an average of eight per page. So they're averaging about eight per page when it's not coming straight out of the Bible, which it's supposedly not anyway. Supposedly it was copied into the Book of Mormon by Nephi uh, from the brass plates that he got from the guy that he beheaded when he wouldn't sell him the scriptures, um, but, uh, you know, grabbed their property when they ran away because he chased them out of their house with his guards or something. And uh, that story I should really tell because it's really, uh, well, there are things in it that are basically physically impossible. So uh, that's getting into the actual Book of Mormon story itself. And people believe this stuff, hook, line, and sinker. So, you start reading that Book of Mormon, you have, you know, Lehi in Jerusalem, 600 B.C., like Jeremiah or something, and he's telling the people to repent, and they don't like him, the Jews want to kill him, so God tells him, you better get your family out of here, don't worry, you got it fixed up for you, you're going to America. So, they leave town, and then they, they, they make it to the Red Sea from Jerusalem in three days, which is impossible because it's like 250 miles, but it says they're in the borders by there, and there's a tributary. So if you look on there, maybe it's half that distance, which is still like, you know, 40-some miles a day. Maybe they had magic camels. Uh, so, you know, they got the whole family. There's all kinds of stuff. It's just really, uh, yeah. So I says, oh, you know what? You go back there and get the plates of Laban. So anyway, I'll continue. So that's probably about a good place to uh, end this video, and we can take up uh, in the next one. And discuss that story because there really are a lot of uh, interesting aspects to it that that should get you thinking a little bit. In the meantime, share the Mormon Truth videos with your friends. Make it go viral. And please do the liking and subscribing. That way you can uh, you can get the newest videos right away as soon as they come out and if you jump into the channel now just left at the subscribe button you'll find an entire library of videos on church history changing doctrine and all sorts of good stuff while you're at it throw some comments in uh, thoughtful comments hopefully and uh, let me know how you think I'm doing with relating this information hopefully it's been uh, eye-opening and a good experience for you all the best